Okay, good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I'm Darnell Hunt, Director of the Ralph J. Bunn Center for African American Studies and Professor of Sociology here at UCLA. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Circle of Thought series. And today, of course, we have Dexter Blackman, who's our visiting IAC scholar um, this quarter. So we're really excited to have him here at UCLA. Uh, Dexter Blackman is a proud native of North Carolina and obtained a BA and MA in history from North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. After working for the uh, U.S. Postal Service for several years and teaching uh, the fifth grade for a year, he returned to school and earned a doctorate in history from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. Currently, he's an assistant professor of history at Loyola Marymount University, where he teaches several courses in African American history and contemporary issues. He has an article on African American participation in the anti-apartheid campaign to expel South Africa from the 1968 Olympics that will be published in the Journal of African American History in 2012. Today, he's gonna to speak to us on the Negro Athlete in Victory, traditional African-American advancement and the origins of the myth of a black athlete. Dexter Black. Thank you, thank you. Um, first, let me say that I'm honored to be here. I wanna thank everyone at UCLA that had uh, something to do with my being here today. Um, and secondly, I'll, I'll just get right into it. Let me give you a little bit of research about, let me give you a little bit of background about how I got to this particular research. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on what you probably know as the revolt of the black athlete. Um, and I wrote it on the revolt of the black athlete as a black power movement. That may sound a little odd because it, it's, it seems connected with black power, but the historiography never contextualized it as a black power movement. So a lot of recent scholarship on that particular movement that allowed me to kind of contextualize uh, this moment into that movement. So I use my dissertation as a way to say some things. I use my dissertation as a, lo a way to study a local movement to say say some things about the larger uh, black power uh, movement. Now there are several components of the revolt of the black athlete. One you probably know is Muhammad Ali's protest against the, the Vietnam War. Uh, there's also uh, student athlete participation in the black students movement and there's professional athletes participation. There's also another component that I focus on and it's called the Olympic Project for Human Rights and it centers around basically uh, Harry Edwards' effort to organize an African-American boycott of the 1968 Olympic Games. And that component, again, is called the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Harry, uh, Harry Edwards went on to be a professor at Berkeley as, as well as continue to be active in a number of different things. Well, Edwards said that the boycott failed to materialize primarily because of something that he referred to as the myth of the black athlete. And I thought that was very, very interesting, right? What, what is this myth of the black athlete? This movement happened during COINTELPRO, and indeed Harry Edwards, Tommy Smith, who you see in the center here, John Carlos, and a few other the main activists were harassed by COINTELPRO, right? But Harry Edwards said that, that of all the obstacles, the myth of the black athlete rather than COINTELPRO <laughs> was the central reason why a, a boycott did not happen. Now the boycott compromised into protest and that's how you get this famous moment. But I thought that was very interesting. So I wanted to look at the myth of the black athlete. I, I understood what he was saying by the myth of the black athlete, but I wanted to know why this idea was so powerful. So in one way of talking about this, really I'm talking about why the black athlete became kind of a, sim, a, a, a symbol of racial advancement in the black community. Why did the uh, black athlete become so popular? This kind of idea that he or she or, or any particular uh, black athlete was responsible for racial advancement. So I told my advisor that and unfortunately she made me write a chapter or two on it in my dissertation. And so as I continued to develop my manuscript, um, these chapters, that parts of these chapters and ideas go into the manuscript, but not. So I've kind of been working on this as an article uh, this particular semester. So I'll read parts of this, but I'll also stop and share some, some anecdotes uh, with, with you guys um, as I go along. So, so let me begin. The myth of the black athlete partially has its origins in civilization. Civilization is a prominent 19th century concept that amalgamated Western religion class Western religious class racial and gender biases to justify European imperialism and the subjugation of women and non-Europeans. According, according to Turner of the Central 
century American nationalist. Civilization, which is the moral perfection of, of man and society, advanced through conflicts with the races. Those more advanced races basically spread civilization, uh, triumphed over uh, inferior races and spread civilization to them. Civilization in many ways can be defined as European social norms, European cultural norms, and Christianity. Now, the ability to spread civilization rested on manliness. Now, manliness, can, as, as this talk is concerned, will basically refer to two different things. A viral manliness, kind of those masculine characteristics that the quintessential man is supposed to possess, but also a cultured manliness, the kind of manliness that allows a man to go out and provide for his family and therefore gives him the authority to be head of the household and essentially uh, authority over people of color and other people who can't possess that kind of manliness. Now, I often distinguish between the two by saying viral manliness, which means, again, these kind of physical characteristics that a man is supposed to have. An example of this is the frontier thesis. Um, supposedly the frontier thesis is the frontier, the America as, as a quote unquote unsettled continent, that experience fused various, UN people, various European people into a viral white, white race that allowed them to triumph over the Native Americans. And just at the, as the 20th century, this white race triumphed over the Spanish who were less uh, who were less masculine and allowed Americans to spread civilization to Cuba, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. According to people like Theodore Roosevelt, who fought in the Spanish-American uh, Spanish War, white supremacy, white civilization triumphed over uh, other civilizations because of Anglo's, Anglo's legacy of superior masculinity. Now, in theory, Roosevelt argued that Anglo-Saxon men were more manly than others because they mastered certain traits. We're talking about these kind of, kind of innate physical traits. Uh, industry, diligence, ingenuity, and sobriety. And this again allowed them to have authority over women, children, of, uh, children and people of color who didn't, surpass, who didn't um, have these kind of traits. Now, as applied, manliness is just a concept or an idea, so it can be very ambiguous. What really happens is that men who are socioeconomically or politically successful are then uh, ascribed to have these kind of moral traits. So if you be, get elected to office or if you own a, a business, then all of a sudden you're described as manliness, right? So I, I want to make that clear. Manliness is really an ideal, and that people usually are attached to the ideal once they become, um, once they, once they become uh, successful. Now, in comparison, African American men were supposed to be less manly for a number of different reasons. But essentially, slavery, Jim Crow, and then institutionalized racism forced a significant number of women of color outside their homes to work. So African American men, by extension, weren't known for providing materially for their families. Additionally, African American men and women were supposed to be sexually licentious. Um, and these kind of characteristics suggested that African, men, African American men didn't possess the manliness to take care of them homes, take care of their homes, or the kind of moral constitution that a cultural manliness uh, suggested, right? Now, post-reconstruction African Americans uh, appropriated, I'm sorry, now, post-Reconstruction African-American uplift beliefs, right, how African-Americans are going to fight for advancement, uh, as well as the myth of the black athlete, was shaped by this discourse of civilization. With the failure of Reconstruction uh, to, force the, the, to enforce the inalienable rights of African-Americans, many African-Americans made this kind of class moral claim to equality. They argue that by their behavior, and, they, and really what they're talking about is em emulating what they consider uh, emulating middle class whites, a kind of cultured bourgeois behavior, that by their behavior, that they were somehow, you know, they somehow possess uh, manliness as well. Now, what I'm suggesting here is not that blacks were attempting to be like whites. What I'm suggesting here is that they appropriated civilization. And they appropriated it to oppose, to oppose white supremacy by simply arguing that the black race lacked. It lacked a number of things, not because they were biologically inferior, but because they were socialized during slavery, Jim Crow, and institutional racism. And Kevin Gaines, who is a, is a favorite one of my scholars, simply argues that even though they are accepting that somehow blacks are inferior, uh, 
they're not saying that they're biologically inferior. Because to say that a group is biologically inferior to say, is to say that there is a gulf between them that really can't be closed. But to say that they're culturally inferior means that you can socialize them, you can train, you can educate them in the ways of, of, what, uh, of cultural normalcy, right? So give, it's important to understand the, the, the reconstruction and the failure of reconstruction, right? It's often called the nadar of black history. You have a spike in lynchings, right? It's one of, in terms of, of socioeconomic conditions for African Americans, it's one of their worst periods. So one way to think about this is that they had very other, they had few other choices other than to argue, okay, if blacks are inferior, they're inferior culturally. And so that you can socialize or educate them into normalcy. And this really becomes, to paraphrase it, what this really becomes is called uplifting the race. This becomes the ideal of historically black colleges and university. In addition to educating them in what we think of as kind of a rudimentary literacy, they're also trying to socialize them into what they call civilization. These kind of moral traits that they will then go out and teach the masses. Uh, I find it very fascinating. James Anderson is, a, is another one of my favorite scholars. Uh, he said this in a film once. HBCUs educated more teachers than anyone else, uh, th than they produced any other professions. Primarily because even if they were industrial colleges, right, there's this kind of debate between Booker T. Washington and, and Du Bois that kind of represents about industrial education versus liberal arts. Even industrial education colleges educated more teachers because the primary goal of black colleges was to send teachers out then to educate the masses. So in addition to teaching them literacy, literacy they were teaching them these kind of traits that so supposedly represented moral civility. And I found that very, very interesting because I, and this is a sidebar, when I, when I was in school, I had a lot of older black teachers who went to HBCU and they talked to us as much about coming to school neat and cleaning ourselves as much as they did about learning in the classroom. And that always struck me as odd, primarily because my mother made me clean myself. She took care, she took <laughs> care of that. But I, I, now I understand what that represented. That we, in, in so many ways, that represented certain things about uh, the African American experience. But uplifting the race, training a group in civility, this became the mission of black schools. Well, in the 1890s, you have really the advent of physical education. Back then, it was called physical culture. Physical education becomes a part of curriculum in most colleges, right? There was a mission. How did physical education fit into this ethos of uplifting the race, of, mo uh, of morally cultivating the race? Uh, in 1897, just to give you uh, 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 a paraphrase, of W.E.B. Du Bois said, that the thirst for amusement, and this is within the context of a larger article, so he's also talking about athletics. The thirst for amusement, along with industrialization, which is jobs, that was drawing young people, young African American people from uh, rural areas to urban areas, can be used to attract them to responsible leadership in the black church and black schools who can then instruct them in race pride, health, sexuality, and the development of Negro character to its highest. So Du Bois is talking about what the purpose of, of, of athletics, physical education should be in the black community. Earlier that decade, before Du Bois made that comment, black schools had already begun to um, add physical education to their curriculums. And essentially there were several thoughts about uh, physical education uh, in, in black schools. Number one, it could produce a viral manliness. Um, and that was important because it was an industrialized society and people, well, there were these new diseases surfing in it, surfacing in industrialized society. So health uh, it, health took on a new importance and how to stay healthy and exercise was a part of that. Exercise could keep you healthier uh, uh, longer. But also by the time you get to the 1890s you have these imperial intentions and around uh, 1914 you're going to have the Great War. So physical education in black schools was also advocated as a way of training black men to be ready to participate in the military. And that in and of itself would also convince whites that blacks possess manliness. So when physical education came to black schools, the purpose of it was to cultivate a viral manliness among African Americans. Uh, so that, that was the purpose of, of, 
physical edu education at black schools. Now, to say all this about a viral manliness, this is how the concept begins to develop in African America. But it's actually a little bit older than this. Since the end of the Civil War, this kind of concept about viral manliness was also attached to blacks in the military. But it's not until the 1890s that you see it articulated fully as it concerns blacks in the military. And I, and I must confess at this point, that's probably one of the weaknesses of, of the article thus far. I, the, the books on blacks in the military haven't really concentrated on this until lately, right? This whole notion uh, and so they, they kind of suggest that yes, it did it did win manly credibility for the race, but there's no real discussion on it until lately. I think actually a UCLA alum just wrote a book, Torchbearers of Democracy, and I just picked that up. And so he's one of the first people to actually start talking about it. So that's something I plan to incorporate uh, in, into my paper. Now, that's how this kind of myth uh, starts in the black community. Um, my screen is dark, so I'm hoping I don't mess anything up. Um, no. Some here. no, 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 no. This computer screen. No, this computer screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm hoping when I hit this button, I don't mess things up up here. Okay. So now, the myth of the black athlete first began to articulate it fully in the 1920s, following the emergence of several black champion boxers and sprinters. But it was, wasn't until the 1930s that the, that the myth gained widespread credibility, particularly in black America. And this is with the ascendance of Jesse Owens, who is one of 19 uh, black Olympians or blacks to go to the uh, Olympics to represent the United States in 1936. And Joe Lewis, who becomes a heavyweight contender at the end of 1934, early 1935. But their ascendance needs to be contextualized within the growing imperial tensions that will eventually lead the United States in, into World War II. Now, just to give you a little uh, sh uh, short history, uh, in 1933, Hitler basically commandeers the German government and he begins to agitate imperial attentions first with France. Uh, and one of the things that it does, he's, uh, he's also uh, vehemently anti-Semitic. And one of the things that comes out of this is that in 1934, a number of American and, and European civil society organizations want the, the Olympics, which are scheduled for Berlin, to be moved out in 1936. So there's this kind of civil society protest that develops to push the Olympics out of Berlin. Now, the IOC, uh, and, and, and well, yeah, the IOC essentially says that Germany's political and religious beliefs have nothing to do with their ability to host the Olympics. So, you know, the Olympics can stay in Germany. But what this does is, one of the things that this does to the American team is, there are a lot of wealthy Jewish people who support the U.S. Olympic team, and they threaten not to support a U.S. Olympic team going to Germany if, the, if, if it remains there. Now, so the boycott kind of fizzles out by the beginning of 1935. But then in 1935, Hitler enacts the Nuremberg Laws, and this basically strips German Jews of citizenship. In addition, uh, he occupies something called the Rhineland, which is this region between Germany and France that they have fought over several times. And, and, and it's a, violating of, a violation of a World War I treaty. He also supports a, a coup of the Spanish government. The Spanish government is democratic. There's this fascist group trying to overthrow it. Hitler, in many ways, is involved with, uh, with a number of these things. So the boycott in and of itself, you know, they're suggesting that the boycott needs to be revived. What happens in African America is, is that they really kind of sit the boycott debate out. No one directly uh, talks about it. You have um, the NAACP is the only organization that directly says that, you know, African Americans should not participate in the Olympics. The U.S. team as a whole should not go. But the vast majority of African Americans says, African Americans in the U.S. team should go to the Olympics. And they offer a number of different reasons. They say, number one, why would, should we support a boycott that the Jews are involved with because the Jews don't support anti-lynching legislation, right? But David Wiggins, who is another scholar, essentially says is that African American newspapers basically say that the best way to refute Aryan and white supremacy is to go to the Olympics and win medals. If you do that, then you will show them that you are as manly as they are. So competing in the Olympics becomes a better way than protesting to gain black advancements. That, that's one of the things that they're saying. Right. And just to give you an example, Opportunity, which is the Urban League's journal, and Urban League was, was and still remains 
a very important civil rights uh, organization. One of the things that they said about the boycott, they never directly addressed it, but what they said was, quote, brown Americans who will march under the eyes of Hitler as a representative of American democracy will be the living rejection of the sinister doctrine of racial supremacy. So while they never say go or don't go, that's their kind of quote, and it's kind of obvious, right, that they, that they are suggesting go. And this, this kind of uh, language proliferates throughout the black press. Now, the uh, Olympic experience there. The Olympics happened in August 1936, and there are 19 black Olympics, uh, Olympians on the U.S. team. And the U.S. team finishes second to the host German team, primarily because it's in Germany and they provide the most athletes, so they get the most points. Now, the Olympics isn't supposed to be a competition in terms of team sports, but newspapers always kept team tallies. And from this, what we know is that the 19 Olympians, there were, I'm sorry, there were 89 American Olympians, and 19 were black. The 19 black Olympians scored 83, half of the U.S. team uh, points. And most of them in track and field which was the most celebrated sport at an international sport at the time. And so the Pittsburgh Courier wrote, quote, if any of the vast throngs who filled the stadium left the individual track and field championships believing that Uncle Sam was a mulatto instead of a Nordic blonde, on the face of the performances at the Olympics, they would have been justified. So the Olympians were celebrated, particularly the 19 black Olympians, for their contribution. And essentially what the, the mainstream papers begin to say is that you know, their performance contradicted the notion of Aryan supremacy. It said little about them being uh, blacks, uh, about them being black or quote unquote Negro. Jesse Owens became the star. Jesse Owens won three individual gold medals, medals and he, he won a gold medal, a, a fourth gold medal, as a member of the 4x400 uh, relay team. Jesse Owens was really feted in the mainstream press. This picture, and there's another individual picture of Jesse Owens in, in, in that same jersey of USA splashed across his chest, was even published in Southern newspapers, right? Now, probably the most grandiose praise that Jesse Owens received um, was at the returning ticker tape parade for the Olympic Olympians that was held in New York City. There were numerous firsts for African Americans as, as far as this parade is concerned. He was put in the lead car which was reserved really for the, the head of the U.S. Olympic establishment. They put him in the second car and put Jesse Owens in the first car. So you, you, you responsible for getting everybody there paying the money, but they put you in the second car. And they put Jesse Owens in the first car. The parade also deviated through Harlem for the first time as a way of kind of honoring the 19 black uh, uh, Americans who participated in the Olympi Olympians and their community for their contribution. And lastly, it ended at Randall's Island. And Randall's Island, for those of you who may not be familiar with New York, is now essentially a kind of big park. And there, Jesse Owens was placed on stage with a number of iconic athletes, including a recently retired Babe Ruth, right? And a number of uh, other Olympians. So his place was really prominent on the stage while the other Olympics, Olympians kind of sat in the front row. And the mayor of New York at the time was Ferilio LaGuardia, LaGuardia, who the airport is named after of, and he responded to a kind of German comment. The German comment was is that the 19 black Olympians were really Negro auxiliaries. And it was explained as they weren't really Americans or American citizens. They were just added to the Olympic team as, so that the Americans wouldn't look bad when they came to Berlin. And LaGuardia essentially said, I'm paraphrasing, we have no uh, auxiliaries, we're all Americans here. Jesse Owens, you're my number one American, right? So in the mainstream press, he was called an American and not a Negro. And those kind of comments actually got more play in the black press than Owen's actual accomplishments, right? That's what people talked about. Uh, the mayor called him, an, uh, the mayor of New York City called him an American. This was taken as proof that virility actually was something, uh, demonstrations of virility were actually something that could advance the black race. Now, I'll come back to that in a second. Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis wasn't as initially successful against the quote unquote Nazis. Uh, in 1935, he lost to a German, cha uh, a German challenger who was a former heavyweight champion. His name was Max Melling. When he lost, in 1935, despite you know the kind of anti-German uh, anti-German propaganda that was developing in the American press, his loss was deemed as the logical outcome of white supremacy. Two men fighting, one black, one white. A white man is always going to beat a black. This was despite the war. 
Uh, so he lost in 1930. Uh, yeah, 1935. Despite that, two years later in 1937, he earned a championship bout against a fighter named James J. Braddock, a white American. He won. He became only the second African American to win the modern uh, heavyweight boxing championship. There's some dispute about what modern means, but essentially uh, people divide boxing beginning about 1880. You have the pre-modern and the modern. And if that is the case, other than Jack Johnson, he is the second African-American uh, to win. And Maya Angelou remembered uh, when, uh, um, when um, Joe Lewis won this, this championship. And she remembered that her family celebrated in an unusual manner. Blacks in rural, in rural Southern just didn't go out in the middle of the streets, holler and scream and talk about Joe Lewis and things of that nature. But she, quoted, she called it, quote, the night when Joe Lewis proved that we were the strongest people in the world, unquote. So she also remembered it as a show of virility. It was the night that Joe Lewis, you know, proved African Americans were the strongest people in the world. Now, a year later in 1938, he got an opportunity to fight Smelling again. And this fight was again clouded by the imperial attentions, tensions that would develop and would lead Europe to war less than a year later. And Another scholar, Donald McRae, he talks about it. The press describes it differently this time. It's a fight between democracy and fascism. And Lewis now represents democracy and Smelling represents fascism. A week before the fight, Joe Lewis is in Washington, D.C., and he gets a kind of note uh, or, or, or telegram at his hotel, and it summons him to the White House. So there's this very famous picture of Joe Lewis at the White House and FDR, who we later know it was in a wheelchair and Joe Lewis is doing like this and FDR is filling his biceps and reportedly it's probably a press it's probably something made up by the press but Roosevelt told, tells Lewis Joe we need muscles like yours to win the war that is coming right that's supposedly what he what, what he tells him now I couldn't use that picture because Corbis has license to that picture it's not disseminated widely through the internet so I, I didn't want to use the big Corbis sign in the middle and so I substituted this picture with Eleanor Roosevelt so when Lewis beat Smelling on, in, in June 1938, he too is called an American press. And I can give you a number of quotes, but, uh, but I want, because I, I want to move on. Well, I'll just give you one, because I, I want to move on. Um, when he's called an American, this is also taken as evidence that whites recognize the manliness of African Americans when it's demonstrated in sports. And that this improves the image of African Americans for most whites, and it's somehow advancing the race. Charles H. Williams, who is a, is a famous coach and administrator at Hampton Institute uh, in, in the 1930s. Uh, after the Joe Lewis fight, he, he writes, uh, quote, yeah, mainstream praise of the athletes, quote, disclose the world more willing to pay homage to where homage is due. The press in every section of our country was generous in carrying in its front pages and sport, sports pages glowing accounts of the exploits of Negro athletes. The American people were proud to have to have been represented by young men who so ably defended the, the stripes, the stars and stripes on foreign soil. Their demonstration and character won new friends for the race that they represented, right? So by the end of 1938, after this fight, this kind of myth of black athlete is fully being articulated in the black community, right? It's being articulated some in the white community because as I said earlier, the kind of praise that black athletes are receiving in mainstream newspapers carries as much weight in black newspapers as the actual accomplishments themselves. So it's being articulated fully by the end of 1938. But it's also contested. It's also contested in the mainstream press. Okay, uh, and I'm going to talk about two ways it's contested, but I think this is particularly uh, uh, interesting. Several mainstream colonists suggested that blacks excelled at sports because they were more primitive, quote, right? That was the word that they used. And this is essentially what they were suggesting that blacks were more animalistic than whites and other races. Now, if you're familiar with the scientific uh, language of race and how it develops, essentially what race means up until the... Uh, until the Gunnar Maidal study in, in 1944. What race essentially means is that uh, there are different categories of human beings, that human beings evolved over time. So you've probably heard of things like Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, human beings, etc. These are kind of different categories of man. Race meant a similar thing. 
And essentially, white uh, or Caucasian or European was the most advanced stage of man, and Negro was the less advanced stage, uh, less advanced stage of man. And essentially, what the white press was saying by saying primitive is that blacks were more animal-like. And animals excel better at these kind of athletic events than man did. So that's, what, that's one way they attributed uh, their success. To give you an example, in 1935, as Lewis was pre pre preparing to fight Smelling for the first time, there was a news story, it was a very popular, that circulated through the press. Essentially, they, they said that Joe Lewis inherited his physical prowess from a grandfather who once wrestled a baboon, right? So they compared him, you know, essentially, to a baboon. Now, they also attributed the success of black sprinters like Jesse Owens to an anatomical structure su supposedly specific to African American peoples. Now, essentially what they were doing by saying that blacks had a specific anatomical structure was saying that they were biologically different from whites. And to be biologically different from someone else means that you cannot close the gulf, right? Now, I talked about biological and cultural differences. So really, in some ways, they're suggesting that he's biologically primitive as well. And the success of these black athletes is primarily due because they're different than whites. So so not all of the mainstream press is recognizing this kind of athletic effort as a show of virility. Now, there were a lot of responses to this. And it's, you know, these things continued even after their success. And after Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis, there are going to be a number of black athletes uh, who win championships in the late 1930s and the late 1940s. So the black press had to respond to this. And Okay, and the dominant response, uh, probably the most notable response came from Edward Bancroft Henderson. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Edward Bank Bancroft Henderson and who he was. Primarily, he was a black progressive, and that means a number of different things. Like progressives, he believed that you could study society. And once you study society, you could find out the problem, and you could implement these kind of Christian moral and scientific ideas to improve society, right? And so if there was a race problem, you study the race problem. And one of the things that a lot of black and white progressives believe is that, you know, people of color kind of needed to be uplift, right? He was also very well educated. He attended Howard. He attended Columbia University. He also attended something called uh, Dudley Sargent School of Physical Education, which was run out of Howard. And essentially, that kind of education led him to believe that physical education or physical culture, they called it at the time, could be a program to kind of cultivate African-American manliness, both cultured and virility in African-America. So he kind of knew this language of race. He knew this language of manliness and civilization. So his response was probably the most articulated, most advanced African-American response to that kind of pernicious racism about being primitive. And essentially, one of the things Henderson wrote was, and, and I'm going to paraphrase here because there's a lot of scientific language, but he, his first response to this was, because whites cheered for African Americans who represented their country, that somehow ameliorated racism. That was somehow suggesting that whites, once they were educated to black capabilities, were, you know, were going to divest themselves of racism. And you couldn't argue that. But his research also quoted uh, another, I like to call him uh, kind of a black radical physical anthropologist, and you'll see why in a second. The term black radical isn't really coined at that time, but a fellow by the name of William Montague Cobb, who was an anatomy professor at Howard University. And, Co and Cobb is quite a character. He ran track. And when he heard it, when he started hearing about these theories about African American athletes excelling because they're primitive, he did some research. And essentially, one of the things that he argued was he contested the idea of biological racial differences or that champion athletes were aided by a unique anatomical structure by illustrating that racially identified groups did not possess an anatomical homo homogeneity that distinguished them from other groups. Essentially, blacks and whites didn't have different body structures. The lower limb measurements of Owens, for example, were categorically, categorically typical of those who those assigned to Caucasians. So Owens had a body of a white man, if you wanted to look at it like that way. Other past champions like Howard Drew lacked distinct, distinctly Negro features like a broad nose, right? Howard Drew was often mistaken as a white person or a foreigner. So if this was true, 
that uh, you know there was no typical anatomical homo homogeneity that was responsible for you know black success on in track and field. Essentially, what Cobb concluded was that race was just a categorical creation by the United States laws and white supremacy, right? I thought that was bold for him to end his article that way, but that's what Cobb said. This is just made up fictitious to bring, to, to further bring black people down. And Henderson quoted that uh, widely in, in his argument, and, and no one in the mainstream press really responded to that. But additionally, Henderson added something else. And I'll come back to that slide. Henderson argued that essentially that a viral masculinity had been, coded, uh, had been um, cultivated among African Americans. And I won't read this, but essentially what he's saying is, it's just like there was the frontier that made a viral, viral white race in America, slavery had made a viral race of African Americans, right? The weak ones had died out during the Middle Passage and during slavery and since. And it's that kind of, you know, so, that's the claim for virility amongst African Americans, right? So he believes in this kind of this kind of process, and he's saying just as whites became manly and able to defeat other races in wars, blacks have now become manly primarily through processes like slavery. And it was an argument actually that was received well in the mainstream press, right? It, it, but again, the mainstream press took it a, a step farther by saying that still there are biological differences between the races, even though there has been an evolutionary process amongst them uh, as well. And so this, this kind of contestation still kind of goes on today. There's a, I, I don't know if you've ever got, a, uh, ever got, you guys have ever heard of a book called Darwin's Athletes mm -hmm. by John Eintein. Um, and essentially, John Eintein is, is arguing this, uh, this kind of notion that there are biological differences between African Americans and white athletes. And that's the, one of the reasons why whites excel so well at running events. And I, um, I had to, he's, he's a white guy, so I had to kind of break something down to him. He was trying to convince me of this argument one day in this conference. And I simply told him, I said, maybe, maybe it's not true. But whenever you start talking about biological differences to black folks, they don't want to hear it because they know what that means. It's the justification for the fact that they're inferior. So I, I really don't know the scientific research the way that you do, but I know whenever you go in front of a room full of black folks talking about they're biologically different, you're not going to get too far with that. But that book came out in 1995. And so the, that kind of contestation goes on today, even though to a lesser degree. Now, one of the last two things I'll talk about, the second contestation happened within black America. Um, and it's kind of a class contestation. As the Olympics approached and people realized that there would be a significant number of African Americans on the Olympic teams, one of the things that came out of this was that the black press began to suggest that black schools needed to put more money into Olympic sports like track and field because those produce examples of African-American manly capability. And by doing that, you, you essentially accelerated, you know, the process or the African-American struggle. Okay, so put more money into track and field. Um, now, to give you an example of this, another Hampton Institute coach wrote, quote, that black colleges do not seem, I'm sorry, Negro colleges do not seem to realize that the development of even a single Owens or Ralph Metcalf, who was another sprinter, would bring more national and international renown to their institutions than a thousand of their so-called football classics, which, which are played by black schools and therefore gain no national attention. If, if you're from the South or know about the South, uh, a lot of Black schools have these traditional football and sometimes basketball rivalries, homecoming, but not just homecoming, and they tend to bring out most of the community, right? By extension, the coach argued that track, track and field meets, except those in the South, they invited all athletes, including African Americans. So the spectacle of African American beating whites would further in track and field events would further educate whites to black capability. And so you saw this kind of debate, you saw that kind of discussion emerge uh, in the black press. But there was a response to it. African American educators and those educators who also ran African American schools, because in the 19 and 20s and 30s, you still had a lot of whites who were presidents of HBCUs in the South. So you have African American educators, and then you also have these uh, white males, and pr pr primarily who are presidents and, and, and deans at uh, African American schools. They rejected this kind of uh, they rejected this kind of emphasis, and essentially they said manly virility 
was not representative of the kind of cultured manliness that was going to win African Americans respect and advance the race. Okay, so they kind of reject this idea. The, the, they didn't reject the idea that the, the, the accomplishments of African Americans didn't change whites' minds about African Americans. They simply argued that it wasn't the best route to go. Now, to give you a little background on this debate a little bit further, really why African American educators respond this way is that in the early 1920s, the mainstream press began to report on something called tramp athletes. Essentially, these players who would go to colleges, get paid and play for that college for a year, move to another college, change their name and play for them. So you have these kind of experience of these men who for about 12 years travel across the country under a different name, collect a paycheck from the football coach and play football for that university. This led to a five year massive investigation that resulted in the 1929 Carnegie Foundation report. Now that report says a lot about education, but the, the, the four parts to it and the third parts talks about the growing financial and uh, financial and academic scandals in sport. Now, this report didn't look at black schools, but if you go back and look at the CIAA, there are a lot of tramp, tramp athletes there as well. And so what uh, many black educators are worried about that if, you know, tramp athletes are discovered in black schools, it further tarnishes their reputation. Many of these black schools have to go to southern state legislatures and get money, right? And so these uh, white men in the state legislature are always looking for a way, you know, not to give black schools money. Many of them have to go on these missionary missions to raise money across what we think of now as the Midwest, Ohio, singing in California. So they don't want to have to deal with this the, the, a, a further tarnished image. And so by 1924-25, many black schools, including Fisk, Howard, um, and Morehouse, have curbed intercollegiate athletic sports. They are do what we call de-emphasizing it. They're, they're limiting the number of games. They cut back on academic scholarships, primarily because they don't want to be attached uh, to the kind of scandals in sport. It becomes such an inter uh, issue that after 1929, Du Bois, and his protege, George Streeter, write a number of articles about it in the crisis. The only time that Du Bois ever wrote about sports. And essentially what he said is, if there are tramp athletes at black schools and it's found out, the white people are gonna take, white people are gonna take it as evidence that there is a cultural and moral laxity amongst black people, and then maybe we should do away with sports. And so, some schools attempted to do away with sports. Now this argument played out it, so, so when re educators are responding to this in 1935 and 1936, they're not just res responding to that ideal uh, of more emphasis on sports. There's a whole legacy behind it about tarnishing the reputa reputation of the reputation of the institution. Now, how the debate plays out is that essentially beginning in the late 1930s, you have a proliferation of African American boxers who begin to win different titles and crowns. And in the late 1930s, you see a number of schools in the Midwest and in California begin to re increase their recruitment of blacks to play athletics at schools, right? And so this kind of answers the, the, the this kind of answers the debate in and of itself that white schools more white schools are recruiting black athletes and black boxers are getting more attempts um, to win championships. So this kind of solves the debate. Black athletics, I'm sorry, athletics at black schools, they never uh, re-emphasize their particular program, but the idea that the black athlete is somehow involved in racial advancement lives on primarily because the press continues to report on what, what we can call the integration of sports in the uh, 1930s. Now, I doubt that I can go back because like I said, my screen is, is black. But the last component of the debate happens in, well, it really begins to happen in 1939. Edward B. Henderson writes a book called The Negro in Sports. And it's really the first book length, book length treatment on African American athletes. And essentially one of the things that Edward, Ed, uh, Henderson begins to argue is essentially there is a history of whites recognizing black manliness through athletics, right? And that's the purpose of the book, to demonstrate the history of black participation in athletics. And along with that, it's all these articles are in there 
from mainstream newspapers that praise black athletes. So really what he's not, he's, he's not only giving you a history of say, black athletes since slavery, he's giving you a history of white acknowledgement of black athletes' accomplishments since slavery. And this book is published in 1939, and, and at the end, and at the end of the book, you know, he pays attention to the, to the debate. And he says, you're right. You just can't have athletics without the moral purpose of cultivating manliness in it. That's very important. But what's also very important is that you emphasize or you put enough money into athletics so that you have these wonderful examples like Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens who've advanced the race. Now this is a quote. It's, it's very sentimental. But essentially what he says is that the German people got hope from Jesse Owens' performances, right? Despite the fact that Jesse Owens beat a lot of Germans on the track and that they were rooting for the Germans. He said that, you know, they got hope from those 19 black Olympians. They got hope from Joe Lewis that one day the Nazi veil was going to fall. This was the opening salvo of America defeating Germany. That's essentially how he characterizes that. And, you know, as historians or scholars, we try to use empirical evidence. This is purely sentimental. But this is what he's arguing. The book, The Negro in Sports, was really received uh, a kind of endorsement from Carter G. Woodson. It was published on his Associated Press and advertised widely in the black press and some in the white press. But that led it to be a, a book of note. For the next seven decades, it's published in 1939, it becomes the leading source on African-American achievement. It's republished in 1949 after Jackie Robinson and a few other black players uh, enter baseball. And so there's a chapter in there suggesting that what Jackie Robinson and the integration of baseball has contributed to you know, the racial advancement. It's republished in 1968. I'm sorry, 1969, after the revolt of the black athlete. It's a different name then. It's a time life book, but it's essentially Henderson who wrote it. And many of you who have the Ebony Jet Dictionary Collection, like my grandmother, you have that book about Negro and sports. Because that, that's where I first saw it, right? But it's kind, of, it's kind of published in 1969 as, again, as a rebuttal to Harry Edwards' argument that blacks should use sports as a form of protest. But essentially, this book, is the most referenced book, even to this day, I would still suggest, about African American participation in sport. And it's argument that primarily that by demonstrating a viral masculinity, somehow African Americans have contradicted Negrophobic stereotypes, improving their images amongst whites, and that advances the race. Now, there's probably a few other things that I could say, but I probably talked enough because my, my you know, but I probably talked enough at, at, at this point. So hopefully I've said enough things to spark questions. Don't want to hold the audience too long because you lose them. So if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Thank you. Uh, who up? I'll take No, you were. No, no, your hand was up. Oh, God, you sure? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, I thought about this before, but um, the, uh, you, you, you mentioned Joe Lewis, and you mentioned a number of boxers that were being, I guess, recruited by white colleges. Well, actually, I. I Is where that was, did I misunderstand you? Or? I meant black track and field athletes. Okay. But after okay. Joe Lewis, but after Jack L Joe Lewis, a number of black boxers actually did, with, did win titles, not in the heavyweight division, but right. Walter Waite and things of that nature. Exactly, yeah. yeah. In the, uh, six, right. Uh, Armstrong, yeah. yeah. He had about six, six different weight title uh, championships. But, but here's my question. Um, did, and I don't know anything about this that particular period in, in the history of boxing in the United States, but were boxers and, and I know there were, obviously there was boxing as a collegiate sport, were black students or black the student athletes, uh, uh, do they achieve anything in the boxing uh, ring in the college world? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. Um, the CIAA, and those of you who are not fam interested with, uh, familiar with the CIAA, it used to be called the Colored Intercollegiate Athletic Association. Now it's called the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association. Back then it was kind of what the NCAA is to all colleges. It was primarily made up of colleges like from Delaware, Maryland, P Delaware, Maryland, Maryland, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, but even the schools in the Deep South 
always kind of came to the annual CIAA conference. And they actually did have a tournament for black boxers, right? But outside of the South, you didn't see many black boxers recruited to um, um, what you, predominantly white schools. Boxing kind of had, and it probably still does have this stigma that it's not necessarily, um, I don't know, you, you don't find many educated people doing it. And so black boxers who did it, in many ways came from the, the, the very low working class. And they did it as a way to make money to kind of escape that kind of, you know, that, the, the low socioeconomics, right? And so it was, as far as I can tell, from my reading, college boxing was never big. The good boxers almost immediately after Golden Gloves, which ends around 17, 18 years old, went into the professional ranks. So you did see teams like Morgan State, of course, which is a black school, had a, a primarily, but when I look at the records about like Michigan, um, Minnesota that had boxing teams, I wasn't able to find any blacks on, on them as well. Now, I haven't exhausted the history, but, but no. Um, really, really what happens is, is that during the World War II, for two different reasons, basketball and football become integrated. And they become integrated because they produce the most revenue on college campuses. So you can't afford to pass up a good athlete who's going to help you win, who's going to help you draw a crowd to a stadium, put you on radio, then later television to make you more money, right? That's really why sports begins to integrate. Boxing isn't going to make you a lot of money. It might get you an article in the paper. It's not going to make you a lot. So there's less emphasis on integrating you know, a sport like boxing than there is football and then basketball. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I sort of have um, four small questions. Okay. Of, okay. Um, can I have a pen? Can I have you? <laughs> no, <they're, they're>, <laughs> like, so, um, so I can answer all of your questions? Well, first, I'll just ask one at a time. Because I just want to know, what is the time period at which you are marking for your for your, um, mm -hmm. for your your work? Because it jumps around a little bit. Okay. And so I'm trying to figure out where exactly are you starting and where are you, where are you ending? Okay. So I, I, I've gotten that question before. Um, Really, I, I'm, I'm talking about primarily um, the 1930s in general. But my whole discussion about the beginning of the myth of the black athlete starts in about the 1880s and the 1890s. And I I'm, I'm just really want to show that the ideal comes out of these, these two concepts about civilization as well as uh, traditional African-American advancement about demonstrating manliness in, in either form. Mm -hmm. So then I am talking about kind of a post-reconstruction period, mm -hmm. but that's just the first, say, five, ten pages, of well, five or six pages of the chapter. The rest is really dealing with the 1930s, and there's a little bit in the end about Jackie Robinson in the 1940s. So speaking of your terms specifically around the idea of civilization, because I'm interested that you are still using the framework of Eurocentrism, because you've separated into virility and to cultural manliness, which does allow you to sort of not talk about women, or do you talk about women? Is that a buy you gave yourself? No. no. Okay. Um, <laughs> because I was wondering, because it's within using those terms, you're sort of circumscribed mm -hmm. to the, the same sort of concepts of virility being described through um, essentialist terms that you're going against with, like being you know, anti the sort of biological reductionism, mm -hmm. and then it makes you have to go into things like you're doing 1930s pre that, you're talking about, you know, muscular Christianity, and mm -hmm. the whole idea of Teddy Roosevelt, and the idea of war, which is really interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, sports supposed to be used for this whole sort of war-like training. Sports is training for war. That's how many um, people looked at it. But I was interesting because you're focusing on discourse, and I wonder, are you putting these discourses up against their historical realities? Because, for example, you use the Maya Angela quote to talk about Joe Lewis. Mm -hmm. There's also that famous quote when Jack Johnson wins, and she sort of brings up the fact that you know, she's listening on the radio, and that, but she can't, um, people came to visit, but they can't go out. That's about Joe that. Lewis. That's, that's not about Jack That's about Jack Johnson. You, you sure? Because he goes, yeah, because he just, he just wanted, he's showboating, and she says, it's not okay to be black outside right now. Oh, right, right, right. I, I was pretty so sure that was about Joe Lewis. The historical realities of what's happening because you use this idea of exceptionality as advancement, mm -hmm. instead of exceptionality as actually re, um, reinforcing mm -hmm. the problem because right. they go back and then you know Jesse Owens is racing horses and he's being co-opted and all and there's no sort of social legal advancements fully occurring for the average black person. So I'm wondering, are you just focusing on discourse? Are you also looking at 
where it's sort of historically rooted in actual changes. Right. Uh, primarily, I am looking at discourse. There, there is a, a little bit of trying to um, deal with these concepts versus reality. But primarily, I'm looking at discourse. And one of the reasons why is, is like, I tried to explain the scientific language of race. Um, I also talked to, in the beginning of the paper extensively about civilization. I want to, I want people to understand that these concepts actually contextualize the belief, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I I did say a little bit about the concept of civilization in and of itself being ambiguous. It really wasn't anything more than a concept, except for that when people at, in the 1890s were successful, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the concept applied to them, right? Mm -hmm. So I purposely try to stay because this theory is why the myth of the black athlete actually proliferated the way that it did. Do you so, think back to the idea of entertainment? I'm thinking of like Ellison, that whole sort of fight. I mean, especially when you're bringing up boxing and they're all going around. Cause you know, the idea of entertainment, and I know not as in like film, but actually as as a as a place to project um, feelings towards, you know. That's actually audience. something I didn't talk about in this paper. Okay. There is a third. There is a third contestation, and that is, is that the black working class, and I found some really great evidence on this. Mm -hmm. The black working class simply sees champion black athletes as retaliation against demonstration. De uh, yeah, de de demonstration discrimination yeah. as well as uh, racist, right? So when Joe Lewis wins or when Jack, Jackie, uh, sorry, yeah, when Joe Lewis wins or Jesse Owens uh, wins a race, the black athletes, they, I'm sorry, the black community, they actually go out and celebrate mm -hmm. and they challenge white folks on the street, right? This happened in Durham, North Carolina, where uh, they had just kind of in the 1930s elected a black wardsman. Mm -hmm. And that night that he happened, he went out into the streets and had to calm black people down, tell them to go home and things, because you're messing it up. You're messing up. They're going to take away everything that we've ever achieved because we get a little bit. There's this kind of notion that you keep black people suppressed, particularly black men, because any success. And why particularly black men? Because any type of success means that black men are going to use it to acquire white women. Right, and so, uh, so I, and actually, I need to address that part of your question yeah, well, as well. Yeah, you, you're skewing, you're you're taking a blackness, and you're continuing to reify. Um, Not quite, you know, but I, but I but I do understand your question. In term of manliness, because right. like, well, what's going on with with female track um, um, track and field during this time? And that's and see, and that's the dilemma that I do face. Mm -hmm. Right, there really is no female track and field until the 1930s. But that's where you're focused at. So that's really great. Right, but it's. It, there, there is no, there is no women participation in the Olympics. There is no college participation in, uh, for women in any kind of athletics. So what you have for women is industrial league competition, right? And it's, it's what it is is this kind of uh, workers' welfare. You know, large corporations start these kind of athletic programs for workers, and women are incorporated in some. So you have a little bit of track and field uh, in, in, in industrial. Um, but yeah, I don't want to call it industrial capitalism, but industrial league competition. And then in the cities like Chicago, police have some track and field. And black women are participating in them. But as far as the literature, literature is concerned, they're an afterthought. As far as women entering this kind of discourse and being talked about, there's actually a debate about this once you get to the 1950s. And the debate is because the Russians have a women track and field team, which means that the U.S. needs to have a women's track and field team and send them to the Olympics and later a dual meet between the United States and, and uh, Russia. And now all of a sudden, women need to be good at track and field because if we don't, you lose the Cold War athletic competition. Mm -hmm. So then you, you do. You begin to have this whole debate about where do women fit in. Um, them beating, and, and you're going to have the emergence of a number of black women, particularly from Tuskegee and then later Tennessee State, who kind of dominate the sprint events at the Olympics. Do you call them manly? That's going to be the kind of discussion that emerges. Now, there are several histories that kind of deal with women in athletics. There is one called, um, oh, it's escaping my, my, my mind right now. But essentially, one of the things that, one of the things is, is there is that Victorian morals, which is, which, which is one of the things that Manly comes out, suggests that women don't participate in competitive sports. Yeah, now, but, but then a Eurocentric, because also because also you're using the terms, you're, you're limiting the way in which you can come at this because you're still historically coming at it from a Eurocentric framework. I agree. Through Victorianism, okay. you're, you're pushing that, which is fine. I agree. We have more questions, so it's okay. Yeah, I think Scott actually may want to respond to your question. Well, no, I'm not responding to that question. No, it's <laughs> all right. 
no, but no, 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 no. Let me just say, let me just, let, let me just say that, that I do understand your discourse, it, and I and I think it's very valid. But I, in the context of which I'm answering a certain question, it it's only peripheral. To the scholarship you're creating, I'm gonna put that up exactly, there. exactly. It, oh, I agree with that 100, 100. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about the relationship between um, Edwards focused on uh, athletes as a real, really almost exceptional uh, actor in protest and its relationship to the myth of the black athlete. Now, what I want to suggest here is there's a possibility that there's actually far more in common when you think about the kind of uh, dynamic um, organizing with Jim Brown, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. There's almost a sense that they even replicate to a degree an idea, if, if, not the same myth, but this positioning of, of the athlete as a very important sort of agent of change. So I'm wondering if we can kind of theorize also that the myth doesn't hold back Edwards. Its reformulation, I think, is a, is a uh, new kind of ideological possibility. So that as such, Muhammad Ali is a catch, right? Cassius Clay is a catch for the nation of Islam, in part because if we can, if we can imagine it, the reformulation to a certain degree of that. Right. Now, you, you just named Jim Brown, you just named Muhammad Ali, and we talk about Harry Edwards. Mm -hmm. They all, in many ways, are products of what I see as it's, it's kind of um, a, a post-World War II uh, identity, black students movement. They're very masculine, right? They actually, you know, openly acknowledge a kind of manliness that they acquire from their reputation in sports into their personalities. They project it, you know, especially someone like Jim Brown. Henderson would ask, because Henderson's still around. He doesn't pass away until like 1975. He never directly comments on the quote-unquote revolt of the black athlete. And Muhammad Ali, Harry Edwards are definitely intimately involved in that. And Jim Brown's kind of prolifically. He will say, what manliness should end on the field. He would say, let your manliness do its talking on the field or the basketball court. You know, that's the way you advance the race. There are a lot of older African-American men at that time. Jesse Owens, who, who was against them, who very much believed in this concept by demonstrating manliness. I mean... Just, Jesse Owens writes a book right after the revolt of the black athlete that says that he and Joe Lewis were the most important people in black America until Jackie Robinson came along. What they did advanced the race far more than anyone and, you know, uh, Martin Luther King. You know, however you feel about Martin Luther King as a speaker for all black people, that, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that they were, so they very much believe in this concept of manliness. But then when you start to do it off the field, Henderson would suggest that you let your playing do its talking. And he was very much against the revolt of the black athlete, just like many older men who were embedded in athletics. Joe Lewis was against it. Jesse Owens were against it. Younger African Americans, while Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali and Harry Edwards would say, yes, you know, we are demonstrating some kind of manliness, off the field, that hasn't acquired us anything, right? Uh, as this young lady brought up, Jesse Owens raced horses and motorcycles through the 1940s. He says to feed his family. Some people say to feed his ego, right? And, and so there were no black managers in baseball, a sport that African Americans came to uh, represent about 40% by, by, by the late 1960s. There were no African Americans in baseball until the late 1970s, Frank Robinson. So while you, the whole kind of myth of the black athlete, they rejected the whole notion that it advanced the race, but they didn't reject the notion that it demonstrated that they were manliness, right? People like Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali's, Muhammad Ali was an icon of the Panthers. You, you, you know what I mean? And the Panthers represent a kind of black power manliness, a manly idea at that particular time. So I don't know if I answered your question completely. I, I, I see this as a relationship, really. Is it something like around also maybe the politics of respectability? Very much so. Where Very much so. The yeah. generation defines respectability as inclusive of the terrain outside of the field. Very much so. Uh, Very much so. They still seem to have a lot that overlaps as far as <laughs> this relationship between the sport and social change. And that's, that's yeah, it's, you know, it's very much so. You know, those people who we really classify as, as radical, uh, well, just to say it this way, William Patterson and Shirley Graham Du Bois, 
sent Tommy Smith and John Carlos telegrams after they protested, wow. right? And it was amazing to see one, see an elder like Shelly Graham Du Bois say, right on, you know what I mean? We could probably understand William Patterson saying, you know, right, right on and things like that. But at the same time, there are a number of important but more obscure people attached to sports who were like, you know, I hope they never send you ins back to the Olympics again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it is, I think it very much had to do with the politics of respectability. And there was this fear that somehow they weren't going to let blacks back on the Olympic team because of the revolt of the black athlete. And that would have definitely tarnished, Jesse Owens saw that as tarnishing his legacy. You know, I started this. I kind of, even though he's not the first African American to make the Olympics, he's the first one to receive that kind of notoriety. I started this, and now you're messing it up. So what does that mean about my legacy? Am I no longer the great Jesse Owens? Am I no longer the forebearer of all of this? Right. Yeah. So it was, he, he really, he, yeah, he really saw it as kind of a rejection of himself. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to formulate my question here. Um, okay. But, but I think um, one of the things I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about, and you allude to this in a number of places, but I was waiting for you to kind of deliver like the comprehensive discussion of it. I didn't hear it, and it's probably someplace else in your in your in, in your work. But I just wanted to talk about this a little bit. This whole duality, you know, mind body duality. Mm -hmm. And which obviously has been an issue, you know, for, for, for decades and decades and decades in African American communities. And if you think about, you know, the discussion we, we've been just having about these different historical moments and which uh, side of the duality seems to win out in terms of making the argument for black advancement um, as we're shifting and adjusting to changing realities on the ground, which is what these discourses are all about. Mm -hmm. we're responding to mm -hmm. circumstances, integration, nationalism, whatever, what seems to work in a given moment and, and their different proponents and there are people from different periods who are maybe wedded to this strategy because of what they were able to achieve and they're against people in later generations who are wedded to this strategy. But somewhere in there is this mind, you know, body duality that um, is sort of harnessed in different ways depending upon the circumstance. And, and there seems to be a point at which there's a transition, although I don't know exactly when that point occurs or what triggers it that I, I kind of hear echoes of in, in, your, in the history that you were sort of elaborating from the 1930s. And I, I was expecting, I guess, you to kind of make the point that um, the 1936 Olympics were this big turning point, you know, um, that um, sort of sort of uh, shifted the, I guess, the, uh, the balance, you know, in terms of the debate. Except if you think of the NAACP, for example, right, I right. Mean, they, they've been engaged in this, this, this um, campaign, you know, since their beginning in the, in the early 20th, uh, 20th century to kind of, you know, uh, discourses of respectability, you know, integration, you know, the way we're you know, portrayed in movies and film. Um, you know, with this whole idea that we have to be um, seen as similar to be embraced and right. to be included. Right. And, and yet some of these other arguments would seem to fly in the face of that effort. So I'm, I'm just curious to, to, to see how you think this whole duality was being dealt with by either side, you know, um, throughout these, 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 these periods. Right. Uh, well, I hear I kind of hear two questions in there. So yeah, yeah I think I, I, that, that's my sort of still trying to figure out how to reconcile. Yeah, yeah. This. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I think the Olympics, it, it, the 1936 are the Olympics are the big turning point. Um, and, and, and in the paper, I really try to frame it into what's happening in the United States as far as tensions go with other countries and why there's a kind of a nationalism, a American nationalism that Jesse Owens and, and, and Joe Lewis and some of these other Olympics get attached to. And that's why you have this kind of praise that, that, that comes from them. That is a, a big turning point. But, and I don't talk about this extensively in the paper, but the, the, the idea of the myth of the black athlete really triumphs, as I was and I don't talk about it extensively, I didn't talk about it extensively today, but because of World War II, the disposable income that's created, all the technological advancements that come from uh, the war, essentially lead to the proliferation of professional sports, right? And, and again, this is part of this, what, what sports scholars are calling the winning at, winning at all costs attitude, right? It's now you have to win to be on radio, later to be on television, to attract the audience. That brings money and that allows you to build a bigger program, bigger sports team to stay in t on top of the other team. Those sports that produced revenue, including wrestling in the South, right, become integrated before, before the other sports. And that really is the kind of, you know, that is the kind of convincing argument. 
you know, there's a continuation of integration of bringing black athletes into uh, these kind of what were white institutions. And so that kind of, there needs, so that, that, that kind of are, wins the argument about does the black athlete really represent a form of advancement for African Americans? The answer is yes, because now there are more of them and they're more visible, right? Now, I, I don't know if I'm quite answering the kind of the, the, the body duality question that, that you're asking, because I'm, I'm not sure if I quite understand it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, one argument might be... Um, is, this, is this, I'm sorry, is this about the scientific racism? Yeah, I mean, okay. you know, it's related to that in the sense that, you know, if, if the focus is on the body, then that kind of, you know, sort of enables this, this, this uh, primitivism argument that, right, you right. know, is consistent with all of the excuses and stereotypes to right. justify all kinds of um, subordinate right. treatment. That and the other. So, so let, me, let me answer it this way. And this, let me, I don't have, because I don't have an academic language that, that, to answer it. Black athletes had to carry themselves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you accomplished on the field, to give you an example, <coughs> in order to obtain a shot at the heavyweight championship, Jesse Lewis, I'm sorry, Joe Lewis's handlers kind of advertised or put out a press release that Joe Lewis wouldn't act like Jack Johnson. He would never date white women. He would never taunt white opponents in the ring. And that's just kind of a, an example of how black athletes had to carry themselves. Uh, in the 1950s, a number of African-American athletes protested going to spring training in Florida because they were Jim Crowed. It was a big issue. You know, our, uh, people like Roseboro, who was a, a Los Angeles Dodger at the time, a number of famous black baseball players, were they actually going to play in the major leagues that, that particular year? And uh, Sports Illustrated, which was becoming a very popular magazine at the time, went down to Florida to do a story. And none of the black athletes would talk to the Sports Illustrated player. Why? Because while they protested in private, they couldn't protest in public. They had to carry themselves a certain way. So, for instance, uh, J Roseboro, who was a pitcher for the Dodgers, went and told his manager, if we go to Leland, Florida again and I have to stay in that roach-infested flop house, I'm not playing that day. You know what I mean? But he never told the press that way. And Jackie Robinson often talked about this as well. Um, you know, Jackie Robinson really sympathized with the revolt of the black athlete. He talked about his 10-year um, career in, in Major League Baseball. He really felt like half a man because while he was out there giving his best, he could never speak out about the atrocities that happened on and off the off the film uh, off the, the the field to him. And so. Um, while that black body was supposed to signify manliness within the lines, off the field, you couldn't take that. You, could, you really couldn't have take that assertive, yeah. that privileges that supposedly belonged to other men, you couldn't. Didn't right? Transfer. Right. It wasn't until the 1960s that when you know, black baseball players went to St. Louis and later Atlanta, that once they just decided we're not going to play if we can't stay in the same hotel with our teammates, that hotels were integrated, right? So the, Jackie Robinson, and I, and I would agree with him, that manliness wasn't re respected off the field for African-American players. So, and that leads to the whole question then, was it ever respected, right? Mm -hmm. what, was, it, was, it, was it ever seen as manliness by white America? Or were they just out there rooting for athletes? You, you, you know, so. Mm -hmm. That, that's 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 the way I, I would kind of answer, answer it through a number of black athletes' it's experiences. Sort of, in a way, it's sort of like a containment strategy, but kind of similar to the duality. You know? Black soldiers faced it all the time. Soldiers at, in Jim Crow yeah, South. Apply it when it's appropriate, and then put it back in the can when, when, when it's not. Right. We got so. black knight at the bar, and we got soldier knight at the bar. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Let him go. We'll do our, our, our one two on the end. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mine, mine is, is was just focusing on Jackie Robinson. That being here, she, we had, he was a, a commissioned officer in the Army, and he was probably able to express himself more during that period than he was when he became a, a, a Brooklyn Dodger, by the way. Willsburg was Brooklyn Dodger. Okay, and, okay. And, and moved to L.A. Okay. Uh, 59 or so. But, um, so let's, and some people said that because uh, Jackie had to hold in all this, uh, you know, keep keep from exploding, he was a very uh, fiery personality, he was very competitive and that kind of thing, that, you know, that he died younger, you know, because he held all that stuff in, you know. That's what his wife, that's what his wife Rachel would say. Yeah, yeah. so it's just, that's not